Well, quick question. It sounds really crazy that uh, in Hawaii Australia you don't know where all the mines are planted. Like the simple, simple science, which you did, because we have the same issue in Port Colton. Yes. Are they, are, they, are they any better overseas in that regard? Um, I mean, I, I don't know everywhere. Uh, so I know in New Zealand they've kind of solved the problem that we were working on here via a, a similar method. So yes, um, in some places. I guess, um, like I said, the, chal the challenge for us really is um, the, what we need to know as an RDC is about the people, not specifically who the people are. And when you start to hit that level, it's, um, it gets a bit confusing, which is, um, if you notice in that video, why there's that, the data is secured by you line in there, because it's, it was the big risk. So, yeah, some have got it. Thank you. My question to Emma is, what do you see as some models to get there in terms of investment? You know, does it all have to be private sector? Can it be an organisation like HIA or some other form of public-private partnership that actually enables some of these game-changing facilities to be put in place? Um, because it strikes me that these sorts of facilities are issues around Australia that would Im significantly improve the ability of smaller growers to get economy of scale and access those market opportunities. Uh, yeah, great question, um, and one that I constantly ask myself. I, don't, I actually think that it would be very beneficial if it wasn't all privately owned um, facilities like the one that you're talking about. Um, and that was really driven by business need and, and I know the guy who's the managing director now and that was like what they've done because of that coming together has been amazing. But sometimes it's really difficult um, depending on, like we're isolated where we are in regards to market gardening. So there's a lot of potato growers. Um, beats me why no one ever looked out their window and thought, uh, could we grow something else here? And it beats me even further as to why the growers didn't come together and. Um, create some kind of cooperative and have their own packing shed right there in Thorpedale. Like that, yeah, I really can't understand why. Sometimes it's about the idea of being competition with your next door neighbour and I think that that's really detrimental to the industry and that's why I think if you take out um, the private aspect and you make it part of the research stuff, if I could, and I looked at that, that dull corn that I showed, we looked at different ways of um, doing that with cauliflower. The issue with cauliflower is that once you cook it, it actually releases gas and then the, band, the bag expands and it wasn't actually that straightforward. So for us as a small business to invest in different types of innovation and you know testing and trialling and whatever else, we, we'll never get a product to market that way because it, even though you might get a great return on investment initially, where do you get that, where do you pull that capital from when you know, you've got to put in another crop and you've got to keep, you know, maintain your cash flow to keep the bank happy and, and keep moving forward and, and that type of thing. Um, we do have quite a large resource in regards to the levy funds that growers are putting in um, and one of the things I think it, that is a bit of a struggle is that um, coming up with new research and development ideas and what, what do we want to research, uh, we've got money sitting there that needs to be used for something and I can't see why if there's going to be you know direct links to actual market outcomes. You know, we've developed a new product and it's an idea of a smaller grower and it might be Emma and maybe she doesn't have the cash to do it herself but she's able to go to this uh, facility. There could be one in every, you know, one in every where the ports are, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, um, consolidation, um, packing, packaging, flow wrapping machines. For me to go out and buy a flow wrapping machine, it's going to put me back 50 or 100 grand. We purchased a flooring machine. It was a large investment for a business of our size. For me to get other growers around me and for it logistically to work, it, just, it wasn't possible. And those um, partnerships that come together, like Select Fresh, they have to happen organically and you kind of can't force people together. I know the government put um, the grants into, you know, if you come together, five parties come together, that they'll help you with the cost, but you can't, and that's a, that's a great initiative, but you can't force people to cooperate. It kind of has to happen by itself. So I think that if those facilities were there and you enabled that consolidation to happen, um, also a registry, I think. So at the moment, I can't work out who grows pumpkin in Australia, which is the challenge that we were just talking about. Um, can I call someone up and say, I've got a buyer in Singapore who will only take my cauliflower if I give him a mixed consignment. How do we facilitate those things from happening? So I think maybe if we stop just relying on private businesses, which require a lot of cash, and we start looking at government funding and research dollars and levies and things like that, that we're actually going to have um, quicker outcomes. Because culturally, we don't cooperate 
uh, like, say, France or the Netherlands or wherever else, where it's just they've always cooperated. And I think there were some statistics this morning about um, the average size dairy farm in India being four cows and the amazing output that they're having. They're not doing that without cooperating. So that, that's a, just a cultural thing, and we, we're not so great at it here in Australia. So I think that we need to probably um, give it a little bit of a push by putting some dollars behind it. Hi, um, my question's for Michael. I'm Jodie Mewitt from ABARES and we coordinate uh, land use mapping in Australia. So I was just wondering how closely you had worked with the state agencies in your project. Um, we uh, work with all the state and territory uh, governments across Australia and they all use the same land use mapping classification and actually grapes is one of the ones in there. So I was just wondering whether you were aware of that data. Um, and how available the data that you're collecting is. So can it be depersonalised? Can we work together with the states so that your up-to-date data can be included in their land use mapping pro, uh, um, data sets? And whether what they've got can help you as well so that we're avoiding that duplication of effort and making sure that everyone's got the most up-to-date data available. Yeah, uh, fantastic question actually. So uh, yes, we uh, we did work with um, DAFWA and PERSA, um, so from WA and SA uh, through the project. We also work quite closely with Vine Health and SA, who sort of are quite closely entwined with PERSA there. So I guess the um, the sort of two parts to answering that question. One is yes, the data exists and the land use classification is there, but. <laughs> Within the, the wine industry itself, there's a lot of debate about that information. Um, so, like, I have sat in sort of a lot of rooms in WA, especially, where people argue with each other about how many plantings there are in their backyard, let alone the state. Um, so, that yes, the data is available, but there's always a bit of a second guess about it, which is sort of the angle what we were com that we were coming at here by trying to make something that was quite visible and auditable. Um, so before I came in here, I actually got a phone call from one of the people over at Wines of WA who were looking at updating their smoke tank registers and all the information that was um, obscured a little bit in that video up there is in DAFWA's databases as we speak. Um, PERSA, not so much because the Vine Health data set has it there. In terms of getting the information back from them, it's it's a bit challenging still that there's a there's a few loopholes um, loopholes there's there's not enough loopholes I probably should say in terms <laughs> of being able to get access to that information in a depersonalised way because the the general argument is if I tell you there's a vineyard there it doesn't you know just because I don't tell you who owns it that's it's too easy to work out and it crosses that line of being able to plausibly work out the personal information piece. Um, which is a big challenge that we've had to work within. So for pilot, we haven't attacked that yet, but we've had conversations about it. So hopefully in the future we can solve that. Okay, another question. Hi there, I'm, I'm John Heaslip from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades um, Agriculture Branch. Um, the question I have is around traceability, because it's sort of come up in a few um, presentations and, and um, sort of the, the benefits of it, because obviously we've got the clean green image in Australia and to show that um, the food that we send to overseas um, comes from that source, that provenance is important. But what does that look like in reality? Does it, is it a hologram on the product once it arrives? How do you actually um, benefit from traceability once, once you've got the, the systems in place to do it in Australia? I guess it's probably a question for um, for uh, Emma, maybe. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think when I'm talking about traceability, like at the moment, on our farm, we have a fresh care certification, which means that I need to know where something comes from in case it gets recalled, uh, and that that's a system that you know, Coles and Woolworths do have traceability systems also, but then when you can have an outbreak of salmonella in lettuces and it, you know, kind of dies off in the media and so we stop paying attention to it, that had major implications for the industry, not just for those particular growers, but for everybody in that um, category. Um, it had a major in, uh, implications in our export markets. And so I think that it's just not quite enough. And like I said, when we're five times the price, uh, 
you know, even the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese producers, they have to have global gap to get into the supermarkets they're getting into. So that's a traceability system. So I'm saying we have to be the Lamborghini, just knowing that it came from lot two of my cauliflowers on this date and it ended up wherever else. I actually don't think that's enough. I think that people, if they're paying an absolute premium, and if we're trying to capture that top 1% of the market, when I'm talking about traceability, it's not just where it comes from, but it's how it's grown, sharing product and pr production practices, and then going so far as being able to quantify like the nutrition value that comes from that food and being able to quantify and underpin that clean, green and safe. Because otherwise, shouldn't anyone who's got a global GAP certification be able to say, well, we're clean and green and safe because our, our audit says that we are. So what do we do above and beyond just that ordinary traceability that I guess most consumers would expect to be there as part of their food? So yes, is it a QR code or something that you can relate back? Is it that we look at... Um, Soil testing across, you know, this is a project that I'd like to put up through HIA, David, while I'm at it. Um, do we look at getting all the different um, cauliflower growers, again, sorry to talk harp on about cauliflowers, but do we do a soil test on my farm and then we look at the nutritional value in the cauliflowers that I produce compared to the soil, um, you know, the mapping of the soil on somebody else's farm and then the nutritional flow on in food like that so that we can start saying things like because of our amazing soil structure, because of the, we, the way that we produce, you're actually not just getting something that's packaged nicely and the value adding is in the cutting or the fact that it's a purple cauliflower not a pink cauliflower or whatever else, but actually from a nutritional standpoint, there's traceability in the fact that, you know, this cauliflower has actually got more magnesium than this cauliflower. And that's where I think we need to be going if we want to justify the fact that we're just, you know, we, we are way above the rest of the market in regards to pricing. So it's, a, yeah, it has to be more than just it came from this patch over here. All right, folks. Well, um, we might call it a day, but... Uh Thomas Sastel Bird and Emma Germano and Michael Rocker are a fantastic example of, said early, some of the really uh, quality researchers and growers we have in this fantastic industry, the most exciting industry in agriculture. So I'd ask you to thank them. Yeah. <laughs>